Chapter 18 is about normal approximations for probability histograms. Right, so in our first example in Settlers of Catan, players roll the two dice and add up the numbers. And we'd be interested in knowing how much that sum varies. So in an attempt to decide if our dice were fair, I actually rolled our Settlers dice 500 times, and here are my results for the sum of the two dice. It's like for, to get a 7, I got a 7, oh, it looks like about 16% of the time. And I got a 6 about... 14% and an 8 about 12% etc. I only got a 2 about 3% of the time. And do you notice anything about the shape of my results of what I actually got? It does look almost normal. Now this is what we're going to call an empirical histogram because it represents our actual data, our actual observed data, not what we think theoretically should happen but our actual data from real life. Now in example 185, we could find a probability histogram that has the theoretical chances of the sum of the two dice. So I made a table of your possible values of the sum of the two dice. So on your first dice you can get a 1 through 6, second dice 1 through 6, and then these are the actual sums on the middle of the table. So on the inside of the table, your sums vary from 2 to 12. And so if I want to figure out the chance of any of these sums, so for example if I want to find the chance of getting a 2, I look at my chart and there's only one way to get a 2. Only one way out of a total of 36. So if I count up all of these sums, there's 36 different sums. So it's 1 out of 36, which if I put that into my calculator, that's 0 0.0277, or if I change it into a percent, so I times it by 100%, I get 2.77%. Now let's say I want to get a 3. So I come up here and I look, well how many ways can I get a 3? There's two 3's out of our total of 36 options. So my chance is 2 out of 36. So 2 divided by 36, put that in your calculator, you're going to get 0 0.0555. Or if you want to change it by to a percent, you times it by 100%, so you're going to get 5.55%. And notice then I filled out the rest of the table for us. So these are the theoretical chances for each sum. And then here's our theoretical probability histograms. So let's see, the 2, the chance for a 2 is about 2.77%. A 3 goes up to 5.55%, etc. So when we look at this, what do we notice? It does seem, again, almost normal. What else do you notice? It seems symmetrical. Let's see, also 7, 7 is the highest bar. 7 seems most likely. Two and twelve, those would be the least likely. So let's just zoom out and look at this whole page. Notice once again this thing at the top is our actual data. That's the empirical histogram, is our actual data. The graph at the bottom, the histogram at the bottom, is our theoretical chances. And you might notice looking at those, do they line up exactly? They don't, so these chances aren't exactly the same, or should I say, the histograms aren't exactly the same. And we've talked about this before, in real life, what we actually get is going to be a little bit different from our theoretical chances, because there's the chance error that happens. When we roll a die, or flip a coin ten times, we don't get exactly five heads, one time we get five heads, the next time we might get six heads, etc. And so your actual data is always going to be a bit different from your theoretical chances. But it should be fairly close. So if you look at these two histograms, they aren't exactly the same, but the general overall shape is about the same. So we can actually now write that in, in example 186. So we are comparing the actual data to our theoretical chances. And we notice that they're not exactly the same. But they are fairly close. Mm -hmm. 
And once again, what makes them different? It's your chance error is what makes them different. So for our theory, once again, empirical histograms represent our actual data. Probability histograms represent the theoretical chances. Now for both the empirical and probability histograms, the areas represent percentages. And now this is the key here. The more repetitions we do, so the more time we roll our die, so the more times we flip our coin, the closer the empirical histogram, the actual data, gets to our probability histogram. So the more and more times we do something, the closer our actual data gets to our theoretical chances. To see this, we're going to go use an applet. So for this applet, notice that this is the same histogram we've been looking at. It's the possible sums if you roll the dice. And so if you roll two dice and add them up. So your sums again range from 2 to 12. The most likely value is the 7. So we're going to roll the dice once. Notice that this outline is for our theoretical chances. Those are the theoretical percentages you can see down here in the bottom row possible sums, then we're going to do the frequencies, which is how many times that number comes up, and then the actual percentage. So I can roll the dice once, and because there's only one roll, and I got an 11, we're at 100%, but I can keep rolling the dice, and notice the more times I roll the dice, we're not very close yet, but we're getting closer to filling in this histogram and following in the lines. And we've only rolled it 21 times so far. Now let's skip ahead and roll it 100 times. Notice that I'm now fairly close to filling in my histogram. I'm still not great, even at 121 rolls. But we can keep going. Notice that 500 rolls, I'm fairly close. My actual percentages are fairly close to my theoretical percentages. I can roll it 1,000 times now. And let's just keep rolling. So we've now rolled it 5,521 times. And notice that my actual percentages in the red are pretty close to my outline in the black. But they're still not exactly the same because no matter how many times you've done it, you still have that chance error that's coming into play. And so I have just a few not quite enough nines and just a few too many tens or too many sixes and not quite enough fives. But overall, the actual percentages are very close to my theoretical percentages. And so this example 187 is just the same thing, just now here in your notes, you can see it later. So the more repetitions we do, the closer the empirical histogram gets to our probability histogram. So this first one is if we roll it 100 times, notice that it's not quite what we're expecting. But we can do it a thousand times and it's pretty close. We can do it 10,000 times and it's even closer to the actual theoretical probability histogram. So the more times you do something, the closer and closer your actual percentages get to your theoretical chances. Let's write that down. So the more times you do something, the closer the actual percentages get to the theoretical chances. And as one more example, now here's the product of two rolls. So if you roll the dice together and then you times your two answers, that will give you the product. And so when you look at it just a hundred times, notice how interesting this is. It's definitely not a normal curve, but that's okay. Sometimes we get things that aren't normal curves. If we do it a thousand times, we can do it ten thousand times, and then this is our actual probability as again for our theoretical chances. So let's zoom out a little bit. And you can see that the more times we did it, the closer and closer our actual data got to our theoretical chances. Okay, now there's something called the central limit theorem. So our probability histogram, the theoretical chances, for the sum of the draws will approximately follow the normal curve if the number of draws is large enough, even if the tickets in the box don't follow the normal curve. Now there's important points here. First is that it was for the probabilities of the sum. This is only guaranteed 
for the sum. It will approximately follow the normal curve if the number of jaws is large enough. That's very key. So this only works if your number of jaws is large enough. And again, it doesn't matter what the box looks like. You can have absolutely anything in your box and you can just draw out tickets. And as long as you're looking at the sum and you have a no large number of draws, then the sum will follow the normal curve. And the central limit theorem is the reason that we could use the normal curve to find probabilities for sums in the previous chapter. So let's look at our next example. Let's say we want to toss a coin blank times because we just want to make it general and count the number of heads. So first, what is the box model for the number of heads? It would be the sum of, well, it's just the blank draws since we don't know yet how many times we're drawing. So the sum of so many draws from this box. And what goes in the box? We're counting the number of heads. So there's a 1 for heads and a 0 for tails. So there's our box. And we're just going to do the sum of so many draws. So we can do the sum of 10 draws, sum of 100 draws, just depending on how many times we want to toss this coin. So now let's draw a probability histogram for the number of heads if we toss a coin once. And does it look like a normal curve? So down here we'll put our number of heads. And we'll start with a 0 and a 1. And then what are our chances for each of these? We're just tossing a fair coin, so it's we're equally likely to get either one head or zero heads, meaning to get a tail. So they're both at 50%. Notice that that histogram does not look like the normal curve. And the reason why is that we've only tossed the coin once, so this is only one draw. And the central limit theorem is only good if you have multiple draws, a large number of draws. So now let's look at what our histogram looks like if we toss it 100 times. So if we toss it 100 times, the blocks are the actual histograms, and then I've overlaid the normal curve. See how close the histogram is to the normal curve? It's not exact. You kind of have a little too much here, and not quite enough there etc. But it looks pretty close. If we do 400 tosses, notice that it's harder and harder to tell the difference between the blocks and the actual normal curve. And at 900 tosses, the probability histogram, so our theoretical chances, get closer and closer to the normal curve. Okay, example 190, let's say you're picking a number from 1 to zero, one to 10. If you get a correct number, you win. Okay, so first, what is the box model for the number of times you win? So we don't know how many times we're playing yet, so it's going to just be the sum of blank draws. But let's see what goes in our box. We're picking a number from 1 to 10. If you get the correct number, you win. So a 1 means you win, and there's only one way that you're going to win, because you're only going to pick one number once. And then there's nine other incorrect numbers. So if you lose, it's a zero, and there's nine other numbers that you can pick that make you lose. So there's one ticket for a one, nine tickets for a zero. So let's draw a probability histogram from the number of times we win. If we play the game once. So if we're only playing once, you can either win zero times or you can win one time. You could the chance to win is only 10% because there's only one ticket. The chance to lose is 90% because there's nine tickets that make you lose. Notice when you look at this that it definitely does not look normal. Let's see, we better label it. This was the number of times you win. Notice we're only playing once, so this is just the sum of one draw. 
Now let's see what our probability histogram looks like if we're going to toss the coin 25, 100, or 400 times. So for 25 draws, notice once again I have the normal curve overlaid, but my probability histograms looking closer to normal. So this is the sum of 25 draws, and it's closer to normal. For my next one, now we have 100 draws. Notice that my blocks are getting closer and closer. So this is 100 draws. And we're closer and closer to the normal curve. And finally, for 400 draws, we are very close to the normal, clo to the normal curve. Okay, and once again, notice that as our number of tosses increases, our probability histogram is getting closer and closer to the normal curve. And we're going to go through just a couple more examples. So let's say now that you're drawing a number from this box, so we just have the tickets 1, 2, and 9. Here's the histogram for the box. So we have this 1, 2, and 9. Those are possibilities. And look, this is definitely not normal. But if we look at the probability histograms for 25, 50, and 100 draws, and we're looking at the histogram for the sum, in, in particular it's for the sum, then at 25 draws, notice how interesting this looks. You kind of have these peaks, and the reason we have these peaks is that my original, the values in my box kind of have two separate peaks. But at 50 draws, it's looking fairly normal. You still have some small peaks, but it doesn't look too bad. At 100 draws, look, it looks perfectly normal. So once again, as the number of tosses increases, our probability histogram gets closer and closer to the normal curve. Specifically, that's because it's for the sum. And our last example tells us that not everything is normal. So our sums, and then also what we haven't learned about yet, but averages and percentages are normal for a large number of draws. That's very important for a large number of draws. But products are not, and many other things are not as well. So for this example, let's roll a die 10 times and look at the product of our results. We can also do it 25 times and find the product. And both of the probability histograms are shown here. So here's for 10 rolls, here's for 25 rolls. Notice that they definitely do not look like the normal curve. They have this huge long right tail. They're definitely not symmetric. They don't look bell-shaped. It does not look like the normal curve. And it turns out that no matter how many draws we make, the product is never going to look like the normal curve.